Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living History and a very special episode. This week has marked the 80th anniversary of the midget submarine attack on Sydney Harbour in 1942, which was a pretty important chapter of Australia's military history. One of those funny ones, I think, that people seem to think they know a lot about, but then are quite surprised when they hear the facts and the details of the whole thing. And so to commemorate this week, which is the 80th anniversary, I wanted to, to do something a little bit different. We wanted to talk about what artefacts are surviving from that midget submarine attack and, and how the story can be told through the items that we still have that are left over from that night in May and June 1942. So joining us to do that is a senior curator from the Australian War Memorial. It's Shane Casey. Shane, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me, Matt. Uh, very excited to be talking about these things. I, sh I should mention we had you on the podcast a couple of years ago when we did a really fascinating walk around the objects that are in storage uh, that the War Memorial has on hand but not on display. So if you're listening to this and you want a really fascinating insight into some of the things in the War Memorial collection, go back and listen to that one because it was fantastic to walk around with you, Shane. I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? I mean, a curator at the War Memorial, I think lots of people listening to this would think that's absolutely their dream job. So what, uh, what's, what's a day in the life of Shane, of Shane Casey? Uh, well, well, Matt, uh, sometimes it can be quite exciting. We've, uh, we've been able to do some uh, um, uh, tours with the ADF to um, current conflict zones, so in the Middle East, and uh, went to do an operation render safe in Bougainville with them. And uh, so travel, a little bit of travel, but not very often. And obviously, over the past few years, that's been very much curtailed. But essentially, a curator is someone who cares for objects in the collection. and we. Um, we try to recover material from either uh, current conflicts or uh, material that uh, people have in their attics and uh, or have brought back from operations. Um, we try to find out the stories of them and, and essentially we try to preserve them for um, the, the, the good of the public. Um, the Australian War Memorial has been around for about 100 years and we have a really rich collection of material collected from all over the place. And often it's it's large things like Lancaster bomber, let's say, very iconic objects. But sometimes it's things like that you have, for example, in your you know the top drawer of your your desk that that dad had and and brought back and, and treasured, or or your you know your mum if she was a WAF in England during the war, um, some small memento that she might have had, photographs, recordings. We've got audio recordings, um, and we have a quite a, a large collection of people here who specialise in things like artworks or photographs, let's say, in that particular medium. But uh, my colleagues and, and, and I um, like to try to specialise in objects, artefacts, so w whether it be weapons, um, rifles, submachine guns, etc., cetera, or, um, or something as large as a midget submarine. Um, but we have a, a really good collection, and it's, it's amazing sometimes when we go into the database and just uh, you know, pick a topic, topic, any topic, whether it be, say, you know, uh, well, anything really. Um, I'm sure we've got probably about 10 or 15 of them. Uh, and these can be toys, um, lingerie, um, you know, you name it, anything. Uh, so it's great. It's, uh, it's, it's never dull, I think. And, and often things have been in our collection for, say, 100 years. And it's only when you, you look at it uh, either in a, in a, under bright lights or perhaps some new documents have come to light, and we, we find out much more about those objects and, and the richness of them. And, you know, Matt, if you and I were looking at, uh, say, Midget Submarine today, you'd probably notice things that none of us have ever noticed. You know, it's, it's like that. It's, it's the value of having a museum collection as opposed to just a virtual one. Well, that's that collective knowledge, isn't it? We, we I see that all the time when uh, you know when when we walking a battlefield, for example, on a battlefield tour, and and people, I could have been to a battlefield a dozen times or two dozen times, and people still point out things that I hadn't realised yeah. um, just from being there. It's just it's just the value of observation. I think that's why yeah. museums are so special and so important. It sounds like a pretty impressive collection, but am I right in assuming that it gets bigger and bigger every year? That you're still adding things to the collection all the time. Oh, absolutely. And um, at the moment, there's a real focus on uh, the current conflict um, uh, displays. So we've recently taken, for example, a, an FA-18 uh, Hornet, which is your big thing. And, um, and some of my colleagues who are working on uh, the um, displays for the uh, Afghanistan and Iraq galleries are, are very, very active, meeting people every day. And, uh, and often people are surprised that uh, we're interested, that they're their little bit of 
that little bit of experience is um, regarded by us as an important thing. But it is, you know, and um, uh, I think it was just late last year also, someone in the Canberra region, or Yass, um, said, look, I've got this old uniform in the attic. Would you be interested? Turned out to be a Sudanese um, uniform. So 1880s and absolutely unique, perfect condition. It was a bit grubby, but um, that actually made it look really real. And um, so, you know, but do you want this? Uh, it's just an old white uniform that's been hanging around, you know. Cool. Well, our eyes nearly dropped out of our heads when we saw it. Um, so, yes, there's, there's more material. And with the midget submarine attack, which you know, is obviously the focus of our discussion today, it's surprising. 80 years ago, um, but there's still material coming through all the time. Uh, and in fact, Matt, you and I were having a chat about uh, some friend of yours who, who has some sort of navigational equipment from that. And, you know, we've never seen that and I don't know what it is, but uh, it'd be fascinating to see. Yeah, we'll see if we can uh, convince him to uh, to at least give you a look at it. I don't know, yeah. I don't know whether he'd be uh, interested in uh, donating it, but he might be interested yeah, in at least letting yeah. you have a look at it to see what's well, out there. Well, you know, it's a funny thing. We, we, we like to know that it's out there, that it's being preserved. I think it's important that there is material out in the, in the public domain as well. That, uh, I mean, my family has material that my father captured. And, uh, you know, at, at the moment, it's, it's still precious to me because my father's passed. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a family connection. And my kids are interested in keeping that uh, within. And I think it's important to, to have that throughout the Australian um, uh, domain as well. And that, and that it's represented in other museum collections as well. I think you're right. That family connection is what makes it special as well. There's been a number of times when I've been leading people around the battlefields on a tour and perhaps at the end of the tour they might say, oh, I want to, I've want to. i got this which was a coin that my grandfather brought back from the Western Front, you know, after the, he, you know, he picked this up in France and he carried it with him yeah. and he brought it back. And they go, I'd like you to have it just yeah, as, yeah. A, you know, as a token of appreciation. Yeah. It doesn't mean the same to me as it means to them. It's, it's a fascinating artifact in its own right, yeah. but it's that family connection that makes, it, that makes it so significant. So I think you're right. I think it's great that, and it should remain that in households across Australia, there is the old, you know, the old bayonet that Uncle Bruce brought back from the war or the, the letters yeah. that he wrote home. I think that's great stuff. I, th I think it's yeah. really important. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk today about midget submarines. Um, I, I think uh, this week we've been, there's been a lot of coverage about it. I've been doing a lot of interviews about the attack and the history of it. Um, just so that we have a foundation, we understand what we're talking about. Could you give us a very brief overview of the attack and, and its significance? And then what I want to yeah. do is um, dig into some of those exciting artifacts you've got in the collection to help tell the story. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, cast your, your mind back to 1942. Uh, Japan's on the ascendancy. It's conquered virtually all of the Pacific. Uh, it's encroaching on New Guinea. It's taken Timor. And everyone's very worried. Australia's been bombed. Darwin and, and Broome and the like. And, uh, and Singapore has fallen. You know, huge loss of life and uh, uh, many, many Australians captured and, and, and now prisoners. Um, and, and everywhere they were unbeatable. And so uh, then all of, all of a sudden out of the blue, what do you have? You have uh, an attack on our most populous city. So five uh, large submarines, and we're talking really large, sort of 100 metre length with crews of about 150 people, five of these coming down, um, positioning themselves off Sydney, and three of those five submarines had what we call midget submarines shackled onto their upper decks. And um, midget submarine, uh, you know, you conjure up a, a thing small, sort of the size of a room, but actually they're, they're really large <laughs> for midgets. These are about um, 26 metres in length, you know, 80 feet or so, um, and um, long and deadly looking. They look like bullets, really, black. And three of these midget submarines then, um, made quite a perilous voyage from outside Sydney Harbour um, and tried to breach then the defences of Sydney Harbour and come in and sink Allied shipping. Now, they knew what shipping was there because the other two submarines that were also outside Sydney had um, hangars built onto their upper decks. And the, inside the hangars were, was a, a Glen float plane, which was a, a monoplane, and it could be assembled really quickly a uh, small crane would put it into the water and it would take off or, or it could take off off the deck. And, um, and these did reconnaissance missions over Sydney and, uh, and spotted the aircraft. And at the time, um, 
Sydney siders, you know, there were a number of reports of these things being seen, but people thought they were American float planes, a Curtis float plane. And, um, and so there was a, quite a bit of confusion because the Americans were around. We had a, the Americans had a, a large a heavy cruiser in the harbour, Chicago, and, um, and, you know, it must have been Americans just everywhere in, in Sydney taking in the sights and meeting the locals. Um, and so it, um, it didn't, it, it, it raised uh, hackles, but it, it didn't really engender the response that it should, should have required. Anyway, on the night of the 31st of, of May, um, the first of these midget submarines um, tried to come in through through the harbour, and um, and uh, unfortunately for it, it got caught up on the the uh, anti-submarine net. Now there was a there was a net. Um, basically, the net was between um, the um, North Head and and, and uh, Middle Head, and and it was um, big chains uh, about. Um, 300 to 400 uh, millimeters in diameter um, and uh, almost like um, uh, armor mesh if you like and but this net hadn't been completed there were, there were still gaps in the, the north and the south portion of it and this particular submarine uh, what we call the ha 14 came in um, seems to have sort of reversed and and then wedged itself on the northern end of this um, submarine net and then in the process of doing that it sort of raised itself up out of the water and was spotted then um, by locals and um, and a man called Cargill kind of rode out and, and he was on watch and he saw this thing wasn't quite sure what it was you know I, I don't know whether it was on its side or up and down and threshing around a bit and he banged against the side of it you know and 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 anyway he convinced himself that it was a it was actually a submarine he then went and notified the authorities and there's there's this whole sort of time lapse lag thing going on in Sydney and people not quite believing that it's a submarine. And anyway, um, the long and the short of it is after about two hours, the crew of the submarine, and you can imagine it must have been desperate for them trying as hard as they could to get out and not going anywhere. And, you know, the, the, these were completely um, uh, electric, so battery operated craft and um, who knows what what was leaking inside and the fumes and the darkness and confusion and it must have been awful for the crew. Well, there were two demolition charges inside each of these submarines and they they attempted to blow both of them but they only blew one and that one single charge blew basically the front of the conning tower um, area uh, and control compartment completely open, killed the two crewmen and uh, and the noise of course you know rocked Sydney and, um, you know, windows were, were sort of shaking and I don't know whether any were broken, but it was definite that there was something going on there in Sydney. And um, and you'd, you'd think that would have alerted the authorities really to you know, maximum effort, but no. Then another submarine um, made its attempt. And um, so there was a, there was a Sydney um, Harbour anti-submarine net, but there were also listening loops. And these listening loops were placed at various distances outside the harbour, and they were basically um, trying to pick up the magnetic anomaly of of the hull of a, any craft that came through. But a lot of them weren't working properly, and the uh, those that were working were hard to interpret. Uh, lots of civilian craft were coming and going, ferries, for example, and it was almost a case of um, you know the the old parable of the boy who cried wolf. And, and that's sort of what happened there. So the, the second one came through and, and it, uh, very near where um, the half 14 was, was destroyed, and it was seen, uh, it submerged, and um, harbour defence craft came, and by this stage they were on full alert, and they depth charged all around it and, um, you know, for a, a couple of hours, and, and, and basically then nothing happened. They thought they'd destroyed the craft. And this is kind of an important part of the story in that um, for a long time, for many days afterwards, they thought that there were actually four midget submarines in the harbour uh, because of this event. Anyway, this particular submarine, though, the Ha-21, just went doggo, you know, on the bottom for a couple of hours. And then eventually, uh, and again, we don't know what's happening inside this submarine. You know, is one of the crewmen dead already? Are they both injured? Are they concussed? Uh, 
anyway, they, they eventually managed to get their craft up and running. And I've, I'm turning to my, my right here because I've got a couple of maps on the, on the side that plot the progress. They then did a, a big circuit in and went past um, sort of Macquarie's chair, did a big loop. They were spotted then and they ended up in Taylor's Bay. And um, they were the last craft to be really attacked. That, that was then the following morning they were depth charged and they ended up um, on the bottom at Taylor's Bay and the crew then shot themselves. And um, anyway, meanwhile, you've got another one then following after. So these three submarines aren't coming in all at the same time. They're sort of staggering it. And there's a lot of speculation as to what would have happened if they had come in together. Would they have overwhelmed the defences or, um, you know, if the mother submarines had not gone sort of north up to a rendezvous, if they'd stuck around at the harbour entrance and tried to pick off ships as they came in, would the story have been different? But anyway, getting back to the third submarine, this is the what we call the M24. This is the one that had the greatest success. So it came in and um, operated, uh, it was coming towards Garden Island, so this is um, you know, the, 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 the eastern side of Garden Island, and the big ship, the, the Chicago, is, is berthed there at Garden Island, and um, as well as a number of other ships. And the, the M24 sees it, fires, misses, and one of its uh, torpedoes then goes um, underneath a Dutch submarine, the, the K-19, uh, which is berthed nearby, and, and explodes um, just to the side of the cutter bowl. And, you know, the cutter bowl is lifted up, and immediately settles and of course probably the concussion uh, and explosive effects of the the blast probably killed most of the sailors on board the cutter bowl but those that that survived that would have been drowned then um so they were the allied casualties 21 um naval um personnel um 19 australians and two brits and um the cutter bowl was an accommodation ferry oh it was an old ferry that that was being used as an accommodation ship um Anyway, um, the um, barn, the, the, the captain of the, that submarine, fired another round, uh, another torpedo, and it uh, also missed, but it ran aground at Garden Island, and, um, and it just sort of beached itself. And there are photographs in the Australian War Memorial Collection of, of it uh, beached and sort of still dangerous. Um, he then um, sort of does a big loop, and it's really difficult to work out exactly what he did and where he went. The, the accounts are quite confused. The Chicago knows that there's a Japanese submarine, has seen it. The Canberra, HMAS Canberra, is also in, um, in port. It thinks it sees something, it's firing. Um, there are other ships firing, loads of rounds going off all over the place, flares, you know, it, the, the explosion from the cutter bowl has, has, taken the lights out in Garden Island, so the whole thing, um, Garden Island was lit up, but then they, they doused the lights just before the attack on the cutter bowl, but then all of the communications and all the electrics go out for a short time, so a bit of confusion there, and um, anyway, the, that particular submarine, though, manages to slip out of the harbour and, and disappear, and it was only found then in 2006 off the northern Sydney um, beaches, and uh, the New South Wales Department of the Environment has, um, they've got some great maritime archaeologists and, and historians working for them, um, a gr great bunch of people, and they've done some fantastic work on diving on that and trying to work out um, what happened to it. And um, it's really interesting that this, again, is the value of an artefact. The, that submarine sitting on the surface, on the, on the bottom um, of the ocean, um, has a, there's a ladder that goes up into the conning tower and this ladder is a folding ladder. You know, it would, would come down and you, you'd fold it down, climb up and get out of the conning tower. Well, the conning tower has been um, um, corroded so badly that you can actually see this ladder in position and it's still in the folded position. So the um, New South Wales Department of the Environment um, um, archaeologists speculate that the crewmen are still on board that submarine, that they never got out. And again, it's... Um, it's quite a long distance, you know, that they had to travel. So there they are. They're, they've been released from the mother submarine. They go through quite heavy seas. They get in. They, you know, they're all geared up and everything. And um, they do this big attack. They 
probably think they've sunk the Chicago. You know, who knows what they thought. They've definitely loosed off their two torpedoes, and that's it. And they're now going for the rendezvous. And but um, they're they're tired. They're they're, they're probably groggy from the fumes, uh, from the lack of oxygen, from just being seasick. Um, you know, who who knows what horrors they had endured, really. And then finally, there they are on the bottom. They didn't detonate their um, self-explosive um, charges. Um, they might have just passed out and, and, and died. Um, now, getting back to the War Memorial then, um, and, and what happened to the, the craft, we know then that there's one craft that's um, still stuck in the torpedo net, and we know that there's one craft now that's been uh, depth charged and is in Taylor's Bay, and we've got oil and bubbles and debris floating to the surface, and you know we, we, we're pretty sure that it's it's done. So the um, the Maritime Services Board, the um, uh, have this massive uh, floating pontoon with a, a a shear legs on it. It's called a Maritime Services Board um, steam shear legs. And, uh, and it appears in lots of the photographs. It's, it's actually quite a really interesting thing in its own right, you know. Um, um, because if, you, if you're interested in Sydney Harbour, it appears all through the 19, the 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s, you know, until it was sort of pulled apart. I'm digressing a bit there. Um, but this thing is used then to, um, they, they send divers down. The divers on the um, Heart 21, the depth charged one, uh, uh, the depth charged one, find that the, the motors are still running and the, the props are still running, you know, zzz, everything's still going. They they work out that, yeah, there's still torpedoes in there. Um, and so, you know, everything's pretty dangerous. And they, they, they basically, over the course of the next two or three days, manage to kind of move the, the wreck of the torpedo closer and closer to the shore using a combination of um, this steam uh, derrick and shackles and and it's a really dicey thing and then when they finally pull it up it's um again very dicey because what they don't want is these torpedoes falling out you know and and, and exploding so the the divers who worked on that absolutely super super brave and horrible nasty conditions you know and then um a few days after they've recovered that and, and put it onto um onto the, the pontoon they take it to Shark Island, um, and 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 it's resting there. And then they go and recover the um, Ha 14, which um, so you've got the stern and the control tower, and it's all uh, exploded, peeled back. But the the bow section has sort of projected itself forward, and so it's about 20 meters forward, and that's recovered as well. And that's got both of its torpedoes still in place. With there are these caps on the the ends of the torpedoes. Torpedo tubes, so they recover that and they bring that back to Shark Island as well. And this is where then the Navy um, sort of says, you know, thanks very much, Maritime Services Board. You know, you can go now. Um, and they take over and they photograph everything. You know, interior. They also recover the remains of the crew members, and the coroner does you know, an autopsy and everything on that, on those. And uh, and the Navy then says, well, you know, look, the, these um, Muirhead Gould, who's the the commander of forces, naval forces in Sydney Harbour, um, makes a statement which I've actually got here. Um, if I may read out, please do. Um, he he um, he gives them a military funeral, you know. And there's a lot of criticism. Hang, you know, these are the enemy. They're, why should we be doing that? And and he says, Muirhead Gould said, um, I've been criticised for having accorded these men military honours, as we hope may be accorded to our own comrades who have died in enemy lands. But I ask you. Should we not accord full honours to such brave men as these? It must take courage of the very highest order to go out in a thing like that steel coffin. I hope I shall not be a coward when my time comes, but I confess that I wonder whether I should have the courage to take one of those things across Sydney Harbour in peacetime. Theirs was a courage which is not the property or the tradition or the heritage of any one nation. It is the courage shared by the brave men of our own countries as well as the enemy. And however horrible war and its results may be, it is a courage which is recognised and universally admired. These men were patriots of the highest order. How many of us are really prepared to make one thousandth 
of the sacrifice these men made. So, you know, that's just, that's coming from the leader of the, the naval forces here in Australia. And it's really quite a powerful statement. And he copped a lot of flack um, from from that. But the, the crew members, the four crew members were then, uh, their bodies were cremated. And um, we were then uh, repatriating diplomatic staff back to Japan and, and diplomatic staff was coming our way. And the ashes were um, repatriated as well. And it's it was sort of, the Australian authorities were thinking that um, this was a good thing to do because, you know, so many Australians have been captured. If we show, you know, we're fairly decent people and we respect them, uh, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll be good to our people. And, and it's interesting, um, apparently, the, the way it was recorded in Japan was, was not the way we had anticipated. You know, it was basically the, the, the thought in Japan was, well, yeah, of course they've returned our ashes. You know, why wouldn't they return our brave ashes? Um, no other country has people like ours. You know, these are sort of gods almost. So it kind of, it didn't backfire on us, but it didn't have the results that we wanted. Um, it seems now, that throughout the war there was that vain hope that if we treated the Japanese in our hands well, they would reciprocate. And time and time again, I've just finished writing a book about the Kara breakout, which right. is probably the best example of how... The, the hope that if we treated the Japanese well, they would do the same for our prisoners yeah, did not yeah. play out at all during the war. No, 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 no. However, one good thing about uh, having this midget submarine wreck here and preserved is that it has actually served as a bit of a symbol of um, reconciliation between Japan and, and Australia. Uh, in the late 1960s, the, the mother of one of the crewmen came out here and, um, you know, with the full diplomatic entourage and... Um, she poured some sake into the into the wreck of the craft and um, gave some mementos, um, and you know, and it was reciprocated. And it, I think, by then, even you know, late 1960s, it was pretty pretty raw still. Um, but that was one of the great, one of the first real um, uh, signs of sort of um, you know um, friendship. I think, uh, that the, on a really tangible uh, level. Um, well, tell us about that. Tell us about the submarine that is in the collection yeah. of the War Memorial, because this is obviously, if we talk artifacts, there's no artifact more important than the yeah. actual submarine itself. But it's an interesting one, isn't it? It's not a it's not a complete midget submarine. Tell us the story. No, no. So um, the two submarines were recovered onto Shark Island and uh, examined very closely, and the, the Allies were were dead keen on knowing, you know, what improvements had the Japanese made to these. Are there any secrets to this? And so you had, for example, the batteries of um, one of them taken out and they went to a, a local Sydney battery manufacturing company. And, um, and there's a really good report in the National Archives of Australia um, by that company um, where they say, you know, th this is really good and it's um, you know, highest quality and I wish we could make batteries like this and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, full marks to them. Um, all of the the gyroscopes were studied, and the um, the propulsion system, the the, the air filtration system, you, you name it. The welding, it was examined, and they found, for example, that when the blast occurred in the um, Ha 14, that um, even though it had peeled everything out, and and you know you, you've got shattered plates, none of the welds had broken, and this was commented on as as an example of wow, you know they're actually pretty good. Um, the torpedoes as well were very, very closely examined and um, and all the serial numbers of the torpedoes recorded and what happened to them. And that's that's there as well. Um, and luckily, much of this material has been digitized in recent years. And so uh, we've been able to go to our artifact and see the photographs and compare then and now. And um, now what happened, though, with those submarines is um, you really couldn't assemble a complete submarine from from one. Uh, because of the destruction and whatnot. And so they ended up, uh, the Navy, pretty much making a composite um, of two of the submarines. So we've got the, the bow section of the one that was sunk in Taylor's Bay, and we've got the control compartment and the, the rear of the one that, was, um, that blew itself up uh, on the submarine net. And these then, these um, components were put on um, trailers and towed around Australia, uh, or the eastern seaboard and um, parts of South Australia. And they went on, on dis public display, big signs on them, you know, saying, you know, Japanese submarine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
raising money for the war effort and for um, 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 sailors' benefits, you know. And so really, although the Japanese had intended this as a great sort of, you know, uh, morale defeating aspect, I suppose, it, it actually had the reverse effect. You know, it was almost a, hey, this is what we, we can do if they attack us. Um, and, and, you know, for many people, this would have been the first, their first uh, exposure to anything Japanese. It must have been. And there are great photographs in our collection of um, people um, writing their names on the side in chalk. You know, Muriel is one that, that sticks in my mind, you know, um, just Muriel having written her name in, in big white chalk. And, um, and, and people also then, um, the, there were these weights, lead weights, and we've still got about, oh, maybe about 80 of them. They're about the size of a, a brick, I guess. And um, But the Navy actually managed to um, melt a bunch of those down, and uh, here we go. I don't know whether you can see this. I'm, I'm holding my hands uh, for the benefit of the people listening to this. Um, it's a, a lead um, a model of a submarine, a Japanese miniature submarine, and it's... Um, it's about 100 uh, millimetres long and about um, 15 millimetres high. And it's got uh, on the side of it, sunk in Sydney Harbour, May 31st, 1942, on one side. And then on the other side, which was the side I was pointing towards you then, uh, Matt, um, made from ballast, Jap midget sub. And these things were produced um, in their hundreds and hundreds. And you could buy them and, and own your own little bit of Japanese... You know, a midget submarine, and uh, and of course the proceeds all went to the war effort. So it was, it was really quite a good, um, good thing. And you showed me that diagram you had uh, before before we started talking. Why don't you hold that up? Oh and, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll also I'll post a copy of it on the um, on the show notes for people who oh, are, okay. don't have the visual it's bit, version. It, it's a bit hokey, you know. It's just uh, it's not to scale necessarily, Matt. But but basically it shows the um, uh, am, I, am I on screen there? Yeah, that's it shows fine. That's the, good. the yep. three submarines. So. There's one that is complete and is still on the sea seabed off the northern shore. That's the, the one that actually sunk the Cutterbowl. Then there's one that is largely now not um, extant, but the middle part of it is 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 owned by the Royal Australian Navy. And that one, um, what they did with that is they stripped the casing off it to reveal the the um, um, access um, hatch. Um, in, in a workings, and so that's uh, actually on display at uh, Spectacle Island, I think it is, um, up in Sydney, and there's just a little part of it. So it's that bit there between my fingers, and then the rest of it is um, the stern and the middle part of uh, the submarine that's now um, with the Australian War Memorial. Um, oh, I should say, the other, the Heart 21, the one that was sunk in Taylor's Bay, the bow section of that is the one that we've also got. So if you can imagine. Um, We've got the stern, the middle bit, and then we've got the front bit, the bow bit of the um, the other one. Um, and then the torpedoes are kind of interesting. I, I was saying that there's this record at the National um, Archives, Australian National Archives, um, which I, I can't remember what it's called, something like Technical Aspects of the Midget Submarines. It's available online for anyone to have a look at. Great reading. Um, and it goes into, you know, the, the minute of um, you know, batteries and stuff like that. But it also talks about the torpedoes. And there was this was a period when Japanese torpedo technology, um, or shall I put that down? Is that all right? Yeah, um, that's fine. Thank you. As um, I said, we'll put that up on, we'll put that in the show. We'll put a link to that. I'll get a photo okay, of that yeah, after yeah, the no worries, interview. No we'll put it up I'll, so people I'll, can I'll get you download a copy it. of it. Um, the um, Japanese torpedo technology was, um, was, was pretty good. You know, they had taken a lot of lessons uh, from... Um, the, the, the Brits and the Germans and uh, and had perfected their own um, highly effective torpedo types and the, the particular ones that are in the midget submarines um, were um, um, you know especially uh, geared towards being fitted into into their own midget submarines rather than regular sized submarines um, the um, so what we've got then is uh, uh, after everything went on display, it came back to the Australian War Memorial then, and it was placed, um, the composite submarine was placed on display outside the memorial uh, until the early 2000s. And then it was conserved. You know, we've got professional conservators here who, who fantastic their job and, you know, do all sorts of creative things with 
making things last for hundreds of years. Um, and, and it was put on display then in our um, Anzac Hall. Uh, in the last um, year and a half or so, we've taken it off display and because we're building a new building there that'll be a bit better able to display it. And it's now, um, those midget submarine parts are, are, are in a storage uh, area. And um, but we're working on a new display for them that um, is really going to be hopefully you know much more easily able to be understood. You know, people like myself who aren't Sydney siders have difficulty knowing where Taylor's Bay and everything is, and and the the track of the submarines as they entered is really quite confusing because they're coming in at different times, and that one that was depth charge is kind of hanging around. You know, it's sort of doing its thing and then it's waiting and then it's coming again. So. You've got this really confused chronology, and and you know if um, you know if the listeners go onto the uh, NAA website and, and look at all the Japanese midget submarine stuff, it's really even in the day back in 1942 when the Navy was trying to work out exactly what happened, it's clear that they only ever got about 80% of the story right, you know, and and we still only know about 80% of the story. Um, in the recent um. A oh, couple of months or so, we've been looking very closely though at the parts that we have, and um, and you know shining, literally shining lights on parts that haven't had a light shine on them for years and years and years. And uh, we we're very fortunate here at the Memorial to have a fantastic um, Japanese uh, translator who who is uh, really well versed in in the old Japanese scripts and things. And and because he's been working with us for a number of years. He gets military technology in a way that probably most modern Japanese wouldn't. You know, um, he's well versed in sort of 1940s technology, and um, so we we uh, we took uh, Haruki um, and uh, in, inside the conning tower of the submarine and had him uh, translate things. And it, it was interesting because we also found um, lots of equipment inside the submarine that were. Um, Obviously, manufactured in either in a, in a Western country, you know they had things like port and starboard, and uh, and it's clear that the Japanese had uh, bought off the shelf uh, valves and, and things like that, um, and um, but um, you know at the end of the day though what what we what we've got though in the in the in the collection is is a is a device or a is it's a weapon of war, it's a weapon that. Killed 21 Australian, oh, you know, 19 Australians and two Brits, uh, and we, you know, we've we've got to always remember that, and and also the one that we've got is one that two men committed suicide in, uh, so it's a it's a very visceral object, and the the area where the blast occurred is, um, you know, it it is a very visceral thing. You know, it was a big big explosive charge. Um, you know, I don't know how big it might have been 30 40 kilograms or so. Uh, and and so it's you know it's quite a moving thing when you look at it that way and and then you know when you remember those comments that I was reading out to you but from Muirhead Gould uh, about um, you know his his admiration and his appreciation of just how how nasty and horrible it was we um uh, or the the West the Western Allies had had their own midget submarines as you know uh, the X craft that um, attacked the Tirpitz and and um, Sydney Har um, Singapore Harbour, <laughs> not not Sydney Harbour, um, and we're lucky in that uh, lots of those men survived and were interviewed. Um, and uh, here in Australia, we had one guy, uh, Kenneth Hudspeth, won the DSC three times in midget submarines. And uh, I think it was him. He was saying on one particular episode, they were cooped into this sarcophagus for so long, and that when they opened the, the hatch and got fresh air after you know twenty four hours let's say of being under, that their their reaction was to vomit, you know, and 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 just and feel just horribly nauseous at the fresh air coming in, you know, and um and the, the condensation just dripping over everything, you know, constantly constantly having to kind of clean things, you know, and and uh, it was just just horrible, you know, it's the smell of uh, Stale odor and everything, and battery acid, and must have been awesome. just extraordinary. It's extraordinary yeah, stuff. Yeah. I, I know you've got the submarine, you've got the torpedoes, you've got other smaller bits and pieces. I wanted to ask you, Shane, what's the point of all this? We can read history books, we can read first-hand accounts. Why do we need? Why does it enhance our understanding to actually have objects left over from this event? Yeah, yeah. 
I, I think um, you know it's it is as you say one thing to just read about it, but but another to actually see the effects of that blast and to speculate on what that did to a human body, you know, and and you know you can again. Um, it's, it is one thing to read um, in very bland terms about you know the five mother submarines and the midget, but but to to see just how cramped it is, and and to know also to look at those levers and and think you know there was there was a human hand pulling that and uh, everything's you know someone was actually in that and um, you often find I think here at the War Memorial that that people um, who have a connection with something um, feel the need. To touch it, and and somehow there's something about touch that you don't get from um, a, a picture, um, and 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 size also. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's not really a midget. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a large submarine, and um, and some people are just just gobsmacked by how how large these things are, and um, and the difficulty then of you know, uh, and and imagining then, um, you know, if you are say from Sydney and uh, let's say you know North Shore, let's say, and you know used to glancing at the harbour, to then come to the War Memorial and see that that midget submarine and, and think, wow, that was actually in the waters off off my you know hometown, um, and uh, it, I, th I think I think it's you get something from an artifact that you just don't get. Um, we we recently um, were given a telephone handset. From one of the midget submarines, and you'd have to think, you know, come on, you know, what's it? Who, who are they phoning? You know? um, and and a few of my colleagues sort of, you know, laughed at that. And, um, um, but again, the National Archive um, uh, documents um, have photographs, uh, one of which has a picture of this handset in it, and it's it's clear that when this thing was shackled onto the deck, the upper deck of its mother submarine, um, and the crew were inside, they were able to presumably. Pick up the phone and um, um, dial into the um, into the mother submarine and, and communicate and sort of you know we're we're ready to go now release the shackles or something like that you know um, and this um, telephone handset it's it's large it's about uh, probably about three hundred millimeters long and it's one of those old fashioned uh, almost like you know the 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 old fashioned one that you you would ring and in fact it probably did have some sort of magneto type of thing. Dynamo, um, but this has got leather on its uh, on the the part where you you you, um, you hold it, and it's bakelite earpiece and bakelite mouthpiece, and uh, you know I held it up and I thought wow you know, well not the last person who's held this but you know there there was a real connection there with the person who had once used this um, in the submarine. Um, and uh, you know you again you just don't get that from from a picture, I think. I agree entirely. It's it's the same when you visit, to, you know, when you walk a battlefield and see a, an old German pillbox or go to the cemeteries yeah. and see the headstones and the graves of the, the people that died. I agree. It's that human connection. And yeah, um, yeah. I recall being a kid going to the War Memorial when the submarine was still outside and, you know, we didn't exactly scramble over it. We couldn't do that, but you could touch it. You could go up to it. And as much as I understand yeah. the need for preservation and context, um, I do in some ways miss the days when you used to uh, <laughs> be mm -hmm. able to run your hands all over these artifacts and feel that that uh, that human connection. It's 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 a really important thing. It's the reason we have museums and the reason why museums will always be important. I'm going to post uh, photographs of these artifacts uh, on the uh, on the page as well. Shane, so that people can see what we're talking about. And oh, okay. uh, next time yeah, I'm yeah. down there, we'll absolutely do a follow-up where we'll go around and see some of these items firsthand because it's one of the things I really enjoy about mm. exploring the War Memorial. But um, yeah, it's absolutely. just been really fascinating. Thank you for 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 adding this this wonderful dimension to this uh, to this well-known story. It's a, it's it's a really wonderful work you're doing there at the War Memorial, and uh, and uh, thank you for sharing with us. Oh well, thank you, thank you, Matt. It's it's great to be able to share that story, and um, and you know, it's, I'd really like to say thank you to anyone who's listening who. Um, you know, has photographs or artifacts who um, who considers these things and um, and preserves them either for your for yourself and your own family or for, for the nation. Thanks, Shane. Great to have you on the show. Okay, thanks, Matt.